thanks for joining us at today's Public Good App House. Our sponsor for this event is UiPath. They make software robots so people don't have to be robots. Today's special event opens with a fireside chat with Beth Cantor, nonprofit tech expert and co-author of the upcoming book, The Smart Nonprofit, Staying Human-Centered in an Automated World. Let's welcome Beth Cantor. Uh, Beth Cantor is an internationally recognized thought leader and trainer in digital transformation in the nonprofit's workplace. She's the co-author of the award-winning Happy Healthy Nonprofit, Impact Without Burnout, and co-author with Allison Fine of the best-selling The Networked Nonprofit. Named one of the most influential women in technology by Fast Company and recipient of the N10 Lifetime Achievement Award, she has over three decades of experience in designing and delivering training programs for nonprofits and foundations. You can learn more about Beth at www.bethcantor.org. So in this fireside chat, Margareta Muchibabich, Public Affairs Manager at UiPath, will interview Beth Cantor about her newest book. I will hand it back off to Margareta. Thanks again. Uh, shout out to Beth and welcome her. Let's all welcome her to this uh, to this great event. Really excited to have you, Beth. I'm looking forward to the fireside chat. Uh, me too. I'm so pleased to uh, be here. And I, I really enjoyed um, uh, your presentation, Margarita. Uh, I think we're like saying we're, you're speaking, we're speaking the same language. It's great to hear. That's awesome. Thanks so much. Coming from you means a lot. So I really want to learn more about this. Why did you write the, the book about smart tech? What motivated you to do it? Oh, you know, I've, I've had a front row seat at the creation of a field, the nonprofit tech field for many decades. And I uh, was there alongside some, many of my colleagues from TechSoup. So I'd give a shout out to Susan Temby and Marnie Webb if she's there. And I've always worked at the intersection of emerging tech and nonprofit uh, mission driven work, mostly as a trainer and facilitator, collaborating with uh, technologists to help nonprofit leaders really understand the relevance and to help adopt the technology strategically, reflectively, and ready their organizations and ready, uh, ready their own leadership. So smart tech, um, and I'll explain what we mean by that in a moment, I think it's be at this inflection point where it's be, uh, common to technologies that reach everyday use. You know, uh, there's this enormous increase in computing power, and it's met with dramatic uh, decrease in the cost of technology. So that means that it's no longer just for the NASA's and complicated moon launches, if you will, but everyday people and nonprofits can start to use it for fundraising, accounting, human resources, service delivery, and even more. So um, the Smart Nonprofit, it's my fourth book, my second one with my wonderful collaborator, um, Allison Fine. Uh, we wrote the um, Network Nonprofit many decades um, two decades ago, actually. No, no, actually, I, I'm rushing uh, a decade and a half. And we wanted to write a, a guide that was not technical um, and that was specifically aimed at senior nonprofit leaders to understand how to leverage both the benefits and also under, navigate the challenges. Can you give us uh, some examples of the, of the benefits of the organizations adopting smart tech and maybe a bit about uh, what smart tech generally includes? Is, are we talking about efficiency? Are we talking about more? What is there for us? So we decided to come up with the term smart tech, like smartphones, smart houses. And, and it's an umbrella term that we apply to describe a whole range of advanced digital technologies that basically make decisions for people instead of people. So this includes artificial intelligence, machine learning, and all its various subsets and cousins, such as a um, natural language processing, chatbots, robots, and other automated technologies. And the reason, you know, we, uh, Allison and I have been writing a lot about artificial intelligence for social good, AI for good, AI for nonprofits for a couple of years now. And we noticed when we use the term artificial intelligence, it, for, at a leadership level, people would kind of lay back <laughs> and say, whoops, that's not for me. That's that's a technical issue. But uh, we really strongly believe, um, given the enormous benefits and given, um, you know, where that we're at this inflection point that, you know, that the use of this technology is a leadership issue. It's a leadership challenge. It's not purely technical. And so that um, nonprofits really need to be working in collaboration with the technical experts and also make sure that they're um, 
you know, including their end users, uh, whether that's internal end users such as staff uh, or external uh, folks such as their clients and donors and the design and delivery of, these of this tech. Got it, that, that makes a lot of sense. I, I do um, feel the same way about, you know, how you talked about AI and, and then smart tech. People, people tend to think about it differently, right? They become more open to, to hearing what, what you have to, to, to show about technology. Besides just AI, it's right. right. And I think there's too much popular science fiction negative narrative around the term artificial intelligence. And, and I think, um, I think at least for nonprofits, the concept of uh, automation and, um, and, and the dividend of time, as, as yeah. you, you talked about, I, I love how you quantified it. But it's not just, I think, the um, you know the the return on investment, which is significant. But you mentioned 16 hours of saved time. What we think, and one of the reasons why we wrote the book, is like how are nonprofits going to reinvest that time for uh, to improve what they're doing, to improve relationships with donors, for example, and maybe take a hit at the abysmal uh, donor retention rate. You know, actually connecting with donors and asking how they're doing. On the other end, we all know, um, you know, and certainly I know from a lot of firsthand experience and why I wrote my second book on workplace well-being is that in the nonprofit sector, it's a burnout bin um, because people are overworked and uh, work long hours. A lot of us are passion driven. There's been an increase for demand for services, but yet where you're often spending that time doing low level administrative work that can be exhausting. And that's been exactly exacerbated by the pandemic. And so if we can free up this time, think about like, maybe we could do things like a four day work week. Maybe mm -hmm. we could uh, give staff that rest they're needed or that sabbatical and still get things done. We want to caution people that automation isn't about just doing the same stuff more efficiently and working those long hours and because you can get more done now that you have saved those 16 hours. And it's not to lay off staff because, oh, wow, we've eliminated 16 hours hours because, you know, we have to be human centered about it. The technology, the robots are good at doing one thing, but humans are good at human centered stuff like relationships and empathy. Could not agree more, Beth. So yeah. since we were talking about work-life balance and well-being, your last book, The Happy, Healthy Nonprofit, was about that. Uh, but given the great resignation, is there a connection to it? How do you, how do you feel about these things coming together? Um, I'm, I'm really happy because <laughs> these are two of my passion topics that I've been writing about, thinking about for the last 20, 30 years. And, and so, uh, you know, when I started down this path, you know, it was actually been writing about this before the pandemic and saw the, the potential benefit for workplace well-being from the saved amount of time, but also, you know, the potential for certain apps to also help with that, mainly apps that can streamline workflow. So, uh, in my work, I facilitate a lot of well-being retreats for staff, or else I'm teaching workshops. And the biggest complaint I hear, aside from the, the you know the burnout and the overwork, a lot of it's caused by these unrealistic workloads. And if you sort of peek under the hood around that, a lot of it has to do with unautomated. <laughs> unautomated manual types of systems that are there supporting the work that take a lot of bandwidth. Um, take a lot of our brain bandwidth and, and make it make us physically exhausted and put this on Zoom and stack it with back to back, you know, online screen time, you know, we're exhausted. So I think if anything, the pandemic has really taught us um, uh, really the importance for well-being and the importance of digital transformation. Now it's time to marry the two. Awesome. Thanks so much, Beth, for, for the great insights. I have a question around <clears throat> sorry, about use cases examples, because I think all, when we're talking about use cases, people have this aha moment and they figure out, okay, I, I can do it as well. So in your book, The Smart Nonprofit, you share a lot of great use cases examples for, for nonprofits. Can you share a few of favorites of, of these examples so that we can learn and take home? Um, sure, that's a great question. We spent, um, you know, the book... Um, aside from talking about like what it actually means to be human centered and helping organizations prepare their data and for um, an ethical and responsible use. We did interview scores of nonprofits about how they were beginning to use these 
um, tools and for program delivery, fundraising, and back office. So things from like screening resumes based on uh, criteria that organizations set, um, uh, determining the eligibility for a host of social services, uh, identifying pr prospective donors from your technology uh, fundraising data, delivering medicine and food to hard to reach places or directing refugees to available beds. And certainly the examples we're gonna hear in the second um, half of this session. Uh, one of my favorite, maybe more specific um, examples is from the Trevor Project, um, which provides crisis counseling to LBGQ plus people. Um, and they created a chat bot. And by the way, chat bots seem to be the most common um, technology that nonprofits are using right now. We came across many examples, but they created a chat bot named Riley, um, <laughs> not to replace the counselors on the front line, but to help train the counselors by providing real life simulations of conversations with potentially suicidal teens. And uh, Riley's always available for a training session with volunteers, and that helps sca uh, staff scale the number of trained counselors without adding more resources. And of course, this is a big problem right now, especially given that the, the, the uh, pandemic has exacerbated a lot of uh, teens in crisis. And the Trevor Project sees the role of the technology as being really human-centered. Um, and really understood what the potential harm of putting an automated system on the front line as a counselor. Um, and I mean, there's many bad examples of that, right? I mean, one of the most famous ones um, is a Twitter chat bot named Tay. Um, that was, an, uh, the automation was one, again, like Riley was uh, very smart and it was self-learning. And this chat bot on Twitter was intended to learn how to converse with young people, but the trolls got a hold of it in less than 24 hours and turned it into a racist, misogynist, uh, 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 swearing, insulting, um, harmful bot and had to be taken down. But let's go back to Riley. Riley is again, one of these really smart, um, uh, natural learning, processing smart bots that learns from socializing or interaction, but it's never exposed to anybody. It's only exposed to very controlled environment and to learn um, from uh, counseling uh, uh, approaches, which are very sensitive, um, they would never let it uh, interact with the general public. Um, some other examples, uh, just really quickly, uh, some of my favorite came because of the pandemic. Um, I think the pandemic uh, inspired, or we might say forced a lot of nonprofits to go, go through a decade worth of digital transformation in, in two years. Um, and one of my favorite examples is, um, is in the uh, food banks, because there was a huge increase in demand, of course, for people with food insecurity. And one of my favorite examples is from Pittsburgh. So during the um, shutdown, kids were in marginalized neighborhoods, were not able to get their lunches from the school because they were at home. So they used AI machine learning to efficiently re-engineer the bus routes so that they could, the buses could bring the lunches to the kids instead of bringing the kids to the lunches for schools. And I just really love that example. And there's many others. Um, so these are great, <laughs> great examples, Beth. I mean, that's, that's just so, uh, you know, inspiring and it gives you a lot to think about. Um, but I, I really, uh, I, I really think this angle that you you touched on earlier about the control environment for Riley to be, you know, uh, safely used. I wanted to ask you about the, um, what are the challenges around um, adopting smart tech for nonprofits, especially talking about ethical and responsible use, such as the example you you mentioned earlier. What could you share about that? Uh, thanks for that question. And I'm sure many of you uh, that are in the chat, and of course, all of you on the call here, and, and of course, you, Margaret, understand these challenges uh, intimately. And, and, and in the book, we're, we are uh, creating this really for 
uh, uh, leaders to understand these challenges. They don't need to know how to code, but they need to understand how code is built and how it may be biased. Um, so making strategic decisions about when and how to use a smart tech really is this leadership challenge, um, not purely a technical problems. And, and as we know, there's consequences to automating systems and processes that range from losing the ability to make judgment calls, <laughs> you know, the, that human-centered piece, like giving the unusual job candidate a chance um, to introducing flat out bias against people of color that's blocking them from receiving certain um, uh, program uh, programs and services. So, and we include many examples of these in the book, not only, um, so we, that we can learn from these and maybe mitigate the potential for problems. Bias can happen in different ways. Um, first, uh, the data that the software is trained on, uh, can be biased, it can be incomplete, there can be issues around the how the data was labeled, data hygiene, <laughs> I like that word, you know, dirty data, um, data that's really incomplete or inaccurate. And um, the technology needs, you know, enormous data sets in order for the algorithms to work. And my co-author, Alison Fine, likes to say, a library of Congress-sized uh, data sets. Um, and, you know, bias can also happen due to the assumptions that the algorithm or the mathematical code that actually makes the decision um, is constructed, you know, is it, um, there's a wonderful quote that I really like saying a lot is that algorithms are opinions encased in code. So we need to understand what assumptions um, did the developer make in creating this tech? Is it, are they research-based? Is it just their view of the world? Did they do ethnographic research with, you know, end users? You know, wh wh where does that all come from? There's also data stewardship and privacy issues that organizations, senior leaders must understand and, um, and having protections on that data. We're seeing more kind of scary types of stories <laughs> about, um, you know, privacy being uh, violated. And I think nonprofits uh, really need to think through a, a, a do no harm pledge in using the technology and not wait for something bad to happen at scale, um, but really be able to test and iterate their way um, and understand what the potential for harm is. And I'll talk about readiness in a moment, but things like having an, a, an advisory group with expertise in ethics and data privacy um, and AI can really help the, guide the organization. And I think this is a really great opportunity for similar types of organizations maybe to share an advisory group like different food banks. Mm -hmm. I've noticed all these conversations in the, in the last few years. Uh, there's more and more thought leadership and recommendations and energy in this whole conversation around ethics and responsible use of, of technologies, emerging technologies. And since uh, we are here also to talk about readiness and, uh, you know, your thoughts, get your thoughts on how nonprofits can, can start their, their journey with smart tech. I think it's really important to highlight that there is also a non-technical component related to readiness as the ones you, you mentioned before. Um, sure. And um, we do focus on the non-technical, the human <laughs> readiness, yeah. the organizational yeah. culture readiness uh, in the book. In fact, we have a whole chapter that's called Ready, Set, Go. And I'm, um, uh, and, and really, it's, it's sort of a blueprint for nonprofit leaders to ask the right questions and to set up the right design thinking types of methodologies so that they're really doing this in a very reflective knowledgeable, strategic, and human-centered way. Um, and, and that really begins with getting feedback from end users, whether that's staff or clients or uh, donors. And, um, and maybe it's, you might start with a, a particular idea around a use case. You might discover in doing this research, oh, no, that's, that could have potential harms, or that's not, the right, that's not solving the right problem. Um, there's also really understanding and working in partnership you know, with uh, the particular types of tools that are out there, asking the right questions, reading white, their white papers, asking the, uh, the tool makers what their assumptions were, and, you know, understanding what's, you know, under the hood, if you will, without having to technically reconstruct it. And then finally, I think that last step is really, you know, in the nonprofit sector, we just want to get things done, right? We don't want to like test and learn if something doesn't work and have to correct it. But I really think that approach is necessary when we're talking about this technology to avoid some of the problems. 
This is wonderful, Beth. Thank you so much. I definitely learned a lot and uh, I hope everyone enjoyed this, this fireside chat. Really great energy, really great insights. So over to you, Beth and, and Nina. Thank you.